Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Thank you, Kent, and thank you, Brian, for the opportunity to be here today. So I want to talk today about MAC and HIV and an update in 2015. So I'd like to cover, first of all, just some general comments about overall susceptibility to MAC and why do HIV patients get MAC. Second, some brief comments on clinical presentation, and then finishing with treatment comments and talking about sensitivities, drug options, and iris. So first, just some brief comments on why do people get MAC, and is there anything we've learned over the past several years about overall susceptibility? It's uh, important just to step back and think, what, what is the source of MAC? And there's about 140 different non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which MAC is one. Every day we wake up, we have exposure in the shower to water products in the house and to the soil, and we get bombarded with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So the exposure is uniform, and it's, uh, it's pretty intense. Before going any further, just a little bit about terminology, since the microbiology of the species names in MAC is quite confusing. So MAC is Mycobacterium avium complex, composed of M. avium, which is found in the environment as well as birds, and M. intracellulare, which is purely in the environment. Within M. avium, there are four species, or four subspecies, subspecies avium, hominosui, paratuberculosis, and it's, it's um, the subspecies hominosui as well as M. intracellulare that HIV patients get, as, as well as uh, non-HIV patients when humans do get infected. So MAC epidemiology, I already mentioned how common exposure is. Infection is also quite common. Shown on the right of this slide are skin sensitization rates, which is the equivalent of an M. tuberculosis PPD, but in this case, the antigen is M. intracellulare, or so-called PPDB, or the batty strain. And you can see here on the slide that about 16% of individuals are actually infected uh, with MAC, at least enough that they mount a T cell response. There is uh, data in the literature that suggests MAC exposure may alter susceptibility to tuberculosis. That data is not ironclad, and there's a debate about that. And also, similarly, that it might affect the immune response to BCG vaccination. Those are ongoing areas of research study. Just an example of some epidemiology data, Emily Ford is a uh, doctor here at, the, at Harborview who uh, we've recently done a retrospective chart review over the last 13 years with the Acid Fast Bacilli Laboratory at Harborview. And amongst 972 positive cultures, 587 were MAC, 74 of those from blood. And that's pretty common if you look at epi studies that the vast majority of NTM isolates that are not tuberculosis are MAC. And shown on the right part of this slide are some of the uh, basic epi risk factors for getting MAC. And as you can see, as, as would be expected, HIV is a, is a major risk factor there in the middle of the slide uh, here with the arrow. What do we know about what is the exposure risk? Is there anything, thing, anything you can tell your HIV-infected patient about uh, what to avoid or uh, how they got MAC? There's a very nice case control study that was done here recently in the Northwest, and what it found was that, uh, what, it, what it examined were a number of risk factors, daily activities that we're all exposed to, that we perform, and were any of those associated with getting uh, MAC disease. Now, this was an HIV uninfected population. It was focused on MAC lung disease. Seven individuals and it excluded HIV and cystic fibrosis, and there was a control group that was matched. The take-home messages are on this slide, and I've highlighted uh, one of them in the red box. And it basically says that there are a lot of water-associated risk factors. Some interesting observations, such as if you swim, swim a little bit, you're more protected than if you don't swim. And that if you wash the dishes above the red box, if you wash the dishes uh, versus not wash the dishes, you're also protected. It's, I think, in the end, a message that doesn't distill in something practical we can tell our patients, and it's more at the interesting level, that some level of exposure through the water probably leaves us with some protection as opposed to uh, having less exposure to water of various types. Last comment about susceptibility is draws on some genetic studies. So, so why do we get MAC? Uh, if you look at Mendelian studies, young uh, children with rare susceptibility to mycobacteria, there's a beautiful set of studies over 20 years that show that the interleukin-12 and interferon gamma access connecting uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells leaves you exquisitely susceptible to BCG and non-tuberculous mycobacteria as well as salmonella. Now, these are mutations. They knock, fully knock out the function of the gene. 
if you move then to adults with HIV, when you wipe out uh, T cells, you know, that would be the apparent major risk factor for MAC as well as uh, many organisms with some of them noted on this slide. But what's interesting is if you compare it to more recent data, when you purely neutralize interfering gamma, which uh, in the lower right-hand part of this slide down here, you also are susceptible to MAC as well as other non-tuberculous mycobacteria and many of the same infections that HIV-infected patients get. And so the, the, the message here is that this neutralizing antibody deficiency of these adults gives you an HIV-like syndrome, but the actual composition of which species are involved does differ. So in the, in the interferon gamma neutralizing group, they get a lot of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria that aren't MAC, although MAC is included, and with HIV it's predominantly MAC. So the lesson from this is that it's probably something more in the T cells that are missing in HIV besides just the interfering gamma that's produced by the T cells that leaves you susceptible to MAC. So that's more of just an immunologic side point of interest. Now let's turn to some more practical matters. How does MAC present clinically and then what are some of the treatment options? So in terms of clinical presentation, there's three classic presentations of MAC. The first is a male smoker who has some damage to their lungs, some kind of fibrocavitary disease that leaves them susceptible to MAC. The second is a very uh, unusual group. It's, it's women. They tend to be thin and to have uh, an unusual anatomy to their chest wall. And uh, they, they get bronchiectasis and then they get MAC disease. And then the third is HIV disease. And what's different about the HIV presentation is that it's, it's usually disseminated uh, with bacteremia, whereas the first two forms are usually localized just to the lungs. Annual incidence is about 4.7 cases per 100,000 in the US. And here's just a, a snapshot of some of the presenting symptoms in HIV-associated disseminated MAC. And it's, it's really the classic symptoms that we encounter, fever, night sweats, weight loss. And then um, at, the, at the lab level, there's also anemia and elevated alkaline phosphatase. Sometimes HIV-associated uh, HIV patients with MAC will also get pulmonary disease. To make the diagnosis for disseminated disease, you just need one positive blood culture, or a positive culture from a sterile site. But to make the diagnosis of pulmonary MAC, it's much more challenging. Shown on the right-hand side of this slide are the ATS criteria for diagnosing pulmonary MAC, and it's rooted in a, a, a mixture of symptoms, radiographic abnormalities, and then microbiologic data. Um, and the whole point of this algorithm is to exclude people who just happen to have MAC in their sputum but don't actually have disease from it. And, and so you need multiple positive cultures associated with either symptoms of, or, or radiographic abnormalities to exclude colonization. HIV patients do have pulmonary MAC, but uh, as mentioned, um, the majority is disseminated disease. So now some treatment comments. It's pretty striking when you look at the treatment literature and you look at the guidelines, how little has changed in the last 10 years in terms of the core guideline treatment. And it's because all the major randomized controlled trials were completed by the early 2000s. So I, I recently, uh, just in, in terms of um, uh, reviewing a few items for this talk, compared the current guidelines to 10 years ago, and there was actually shockingly few changes in those guidelines. Uh, but just to review them and to make a few comments about them, first is the guidelines for MAC prevention. So if you have a CD4 count less than 50, that would be an indication to start a macrolide to prevent development of disseminated MAC. And the recommendations are azithro or clarithro as the preferred regimens you know, with different dosing options. There is a B1 recommendation for rifibutin if, if in case there is some contraindication to a macrolide, uh, but there is a very uh, understandable reluctance to go to rifibutin because of all the drug interactions. So the macrolides are definitely the mainstay. Second would be the guideline recommendations for MAC treatment. So the preferred is at least two drugs, and usually clarithroethambutol or azithroethambutol. Uh, there's always been a debate about whether to add a third or fourth drug. There's never been unequivocal data as to when that should be done or if it should be done. The, the guidelines state, and I think there's a, these are very reasonable guidelines, if you have advanced HIV with, with a high max CFU load, or if for some reason that patient is not on antiretroviral therapy, that would be a good uh, uh, time to at least think about it. But um, there's a, a lot of clinical judgment there, and there's no mandatory need to add a third or fourth drug. And partly it's related to the options. Rifibutin with its drug interactions, aminoglycosides with their nephro and um, cochlear toxicity are, are both problematic. Uh, fluoroquinolones are not hard to add in terms of side effect profile. Uh, but, uh, but the options are not always uh, as nice as we would like.
what do we expect with treatment response? There's a nice meta-analysis that came out last year. It looked at MAC treatment responses in those with HIV and without HIV. And here on this slide is the uh, summary plot of those with HIV. And you can see a pretty dismal success rate, about 40%. And that is pretty similar to what's found in the non-HIV literature. I think the, the actual experience with HIV-associated MAC is better than 40% because this composite meta-analysis includes a lot of studies that were done in the pre-heart era or the early ART era. So I, I, my, my uh, feeling, but not based on, 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 on a lot of fresh data, is that we do better than 40% with disseminated MAC uh, because we are getting immune reconstitution often at the same time. Should we check sensitivities? Uh, yes. So the, 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 the key for MAC is to make sure it's macrolide sensitive. It's not clear that you need to check a whole panel of sensitivities. A lot of reference labs will give you back a report with full sensitivities, but uh, the key is that you know that it's macrolide sensitive since that's the cornerstone of therapy. This slide also has the recommendations for susceptibility testing for other non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And as you can see, it really varies by NTM, and it, there's no routine one set way for all of the NTMs. The data behind MAC senses is shown in this slide, and it, it stratified the analysis in that, in that previous meta-analysis. It stratified the data by whether you were on a macrolide, uh, shown in this upper panel, versus not on a macrolide in the lower panel. And you can see that the success rate is about twofold difference, and it, it, it is evidence-based that the macrolides do matter. Few, uh, few final comments on treatment options, and it's, it's a general comment about rifamycins that uh, just to highlight and emphasize how challenging they can be in, on, on all of medicine and very much so in HIV with all the drug-drug interactions. So rifampin is our biggest problem. It's a, a, the most potent known inducer of phase one cytochrome P450 enzymes, and it also induces phase two. You can see here that it induces uh, several enzymes compared to the other rifamycins, rifabutin and rifapentine. So it's, it, it both induces more of them, and its potency is higher potency. So uh, luckily, in the US, it, rifabutin is available, and that substitution for rifampin is very useful. So you can at least decrease a lot of these drug interaction problems, although you cannot eliminate them. And it has effects uh, for protease inhibitor dosing, uh, methadone, and then also cyclosporine if they happen to be a transplant patient. And then just a reminder, because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a major issue, is that birth control pill effectiveness uh, is, is compromised by the rifamycin family, so add a barrier method. Here's just some examples of some of those drug substitutions. So if you are, are needing to use a rifamycin, uh, rifampin, or rifabutin, then uh, if you uh, have an option, and usually you will, stick to the drugs on the right-hand column here in terms of uh, the different classes of drugs that you may be using for various indications. And just a note for your macrolide choice, we often end up with a zithro in a MAC regimen because the uh, of uh, if, if we end up uh, having rifabutin on board as well. Uh, last guideline comment is when to discontinue MAC treatment. And it's, it's a lengthy treatment, at least 12 months. You have to have clinical evidence of cure, and you have to get some immune reconstitution and get the CD4 count over 100 with, uh, with your ART duration being at least six months. Final comments are on IRIS. So there's not a large body of iris literature that is similar to the TB iris literature, but iris clearly occurs with MAC. The mycobacteria in general are infamous for the amount of iris-associated disease. There is something unusual about the mycobacteria species that lends itself to more iris. With M. leprae, le leprosy being maybe the um, best example in terms of a long history of iris-like syndromes that occurred long before HIV was ever uh, a factor. In the case of MAC, the general guidelines are to start your MAC treatment for at least two weeks before starting uh, your ART treatment. And the analogy is within the TB guidelines with, with those uh, um, several large randomized controlled trials about the timing of initiation of ART and TB treatment. And for the individuals who were uh, very sick with low CD4 counts, the goal is to get them on ART quickly, but to wait at least two weeks. And given that most MAC patients with HIV have a CD4 count of less than 50, it's very sensible to, to mirror that guideline and to start quickly, but after two weeks. If they do get iris, uh, NSAIDs are a good initial thing to try, and then if that's not successful, then to try prednisone. Little bit of MAC iris data. There's actually very little out there. This is a retrospective chart review, only 20 cases, but it's the largest 
a study that's out there. And so these individuals had uh, confirmed iris um, after starting ART within six months of follow-up. And it's, there's a few striking messages from this. First of all is the median time to iris, about 2.6 months. But look at that range, 10 days to 4.7 years. And I think this is one of those facts that makes clinical medicine very challenging, is that you really have to keep iris on your radar screen for quite a long time when you are treating someone with MAC and with uh, HIV. Second is that it's pretty uh, diffuse in terms of where it can present, lymph node, GI tract, and liver. And the third is it's a pretty good response rate, 80% response rate, uh, that uh, most individuals will get through this, uh, although uh, with a fair bit of morbidity in terms of discomfort and pain, uh, they will get through it and, um, and, and eventually uh, be cured. So final slide with summary points. So in terms of risk factors, interferon gamma is important, but additional T-cell defects do matter. For the diagnosis, you just need one positive blood culture for disseminated disease. It's more challenging for pulmonary MAC, and you have to distinguish colonization from disease with the ATS criteria. Third is that treatment, the general theme is multidrug and lengthy. Two drugs are generally okay, despite the long debates about whether a third or fourth drug should be added. Uh, and uh, macrolides are essential. And if you do need erythromycin, just be careful about all the drug interactions and uh, have a close relationship with pharmacists and, and have a lot of dialogue. And then final comment for IRIS, there's not a lot of data to guide treatment, so it's um, really predicated on the analogies with TB and to get your ART started soon after you, uh, about two weeks after you initiate your MAC treatment. Uh, and that is the end. If you want any additional references, uh, please um, uh, see these references, which are full of a lot of good additional information.